That is a flag of which we can all be proud. And to anyone in trouble at sea, regardless of nationality, it could be the most welcome sight in the world. The letters RNLI stand for Royal National Lifeboat Institution. Founded in 1824, the first of its kind in the world, dedicated by Royal Charter to the saving of life from shipwreck, and it is supported entirely by voluntary contribution. Now, that word voluntary is very important. It means that when someone's life is in danger, the RNLI people who respond to the call are all themselves volunteers. Lifeboat! By their own choice, they are prepared to leave at any time, day or night, whatever they may be doing, and put to sea. The insurance broker ashore may be the radar navigator in the lifeboat, the publican, the four deckhand, the man who runs the local garage, the coxswain, who knows every shoal and reef of his coastline. More often than not, there's a waiting list for a place in the crew, and there are families of lifeboat men going back for five or six generations. That was the opening sequence of a television appeal I made some years ago. It was shown on BBC One, and it raised quite a lot of money, as I recall. But the trouble with films like that is that they are of necessity very short. There was no time to give anything approaching a detailed account of the institution and its work. We saw lifeboatmen in action, it is true. But no chance to ask them why it is they do what they do. What is it? that induces a man to put to sea, often in the most appalling conditions, because someone else is in trouble. Willie Jones, coxswain of the Hollyhead lifeboat, how long have you been doing it? Well, I've been a lifeboat man for 26 years, and a coxswain for about 18 years. Haven't you had enough yet? Not really, because uh, I think uh, I get great satisfaction of this kind of life. Uh, many persons like different types of challenge, but this has been my challenge. Brian Thompson, why do you do it? Hmm, now that's a question you get asked a lot, and I don't really know the answer. I sometimes wonder on a stormy night in the winter, but I think if I was out there, I'd like to feel that somebody would come and get me. Dave Barry, it is dangerous, though, isn't it? When I took the second mechanics job, I had to take my family's point of view, uh, so I, uh, we had a discussion about it, and uh, I told her that uh, that was my passion to go to sea and to life of that, and it'd been a dangerous and she fully understand my motive and she's full agreement. Are, are you a family man, Brian? I am. I have two young children, yes. What does your wife feel about it? Um, she puts up with it. I think they have to be admired, the wives, because they have a lot to put up with. We know what's going on, but they're completely in the dark when we go out. Have you ever regretted it? Not for one minute, no. We have worked with the finest equipment in the world, in my opinion, anyway, and, uh, and the finest boats. And uh, it's not often that you get a chance to do that. And uh, over the years, I've had great satisfaction for what I've been doing. That tradition of service goes back a long time, more than 160 years, in fact, to the days of oars and sail when horses were used to launch and recover over the beach. The steam era produced beautiful craft, many of which were technically very advanced. Epic deeds were performed all around the coast. Some inspired major artists of the day. of Henry Blogg, for example, the most decorated of all lifeboatmen. But other brave tales are recorded only in the copper plate handwriting of the institution's carefully preserved archives. Well, let's take this one, for example. March the 23rd, 1866, position of wreck, Cardiff Sands, wind and weather, southwesterly heavy gale to the brig Claudia of Belfast, and the result of the service, rescued vessel and seven lives. Cost of service, 11 pounds 14. 
Down the years, the technology has changed almost beyond recognition. What has remained constant and unflinching is the courage, the skill, the self-discipline and devotion of the lifeboat coxswains and crews. The boat of today is a far cry from its predecessor even of as little as 10 years ago. The RNLI's 258 boats on station and 80 in reserve is not only unique, but the world's most advanced fleet, dedicated solely to the purpose of rescue at sea. Take this time, for example. Speed, 18 knots, 850 horsepower, duration 12 hours at sea without refueling. And an interesting technical challenge, specifically designed for launch from existing slipways and boathouses, many built more than 70 years ago. And another interesting point, it is the 40th lifeboat to be paid for by the Civil Service Fund. There's the breed, slightly smaller than the Tyne at 33 feet as opposed to 47, but a couple of knots quicker at 20 knots. She can only lie afloat and was in fact developed from a commercial design. Crew of four as opposed to seven. There are in fact 12 breeds in the fleet and the building program is now completed. When it was introduced in 1971, the design of the Aran represented a fundamental departure from the traditional lifeboat. Inherently capable of self-writing from a capsize, as are all her sisters of the present generation, her high superstructure provides unprecedented operational advantages. She can maintain her full 18 knots in severe weather for 250 nautical miles. She won the Duke of Edinburgh's Special Design Council Award in 1982, and now on station around the coast, she is the darling of all who know her regal ways. The wheelhouse of a modern lifeboat is remarkably like the flight deck of a big jet aeroplane. Controls and instruments ready to hand and eye. Strong, comfortable seats specially designed for the crew. Warm, dry accommodation, of course, and the latest electronic communication and navigation aids. Radar, of course, decker navigator, and this very important and new piece of kit, it's called VHFDF, and it will give the coxswain an accurate course to steer to any casualty, provided that vessel can transmit on the kind of radio with which virtually all seagoing vessels are now equipped, including yachts and fishing boats. That's 
But the backbone of the fleet is still the more traditional type of lifeboat, like this 48-foot, 6-inch Oakley, for example. These will gradually be replaced by the faster types as money and resources become available. But meantime, they continue to give excellent and reliable service around the coasts. The RNLI pioneered the use of inflatables and semi-rigid hulls, as they are called, primarily for short-distance high-speed response, and this is the first of the family, the D-Class, with a powerful 40-horsepower outboard engine and tough and resilient double-skin neoprene hull. This is an extremely effective craft, despite and indeed because of its small overall dimensions. The institution's depot at Cowes is dedicated to the specialized technology of an inflatable lifeboat demanding new craft skills and the nimble fingers of ladies are more relevant than the horny hand of the traditional boat builder. The largest of this type is the Medina. Now completing a long and arduous program of development, she'll be the first of the RNLI's boats to use water jet propulsion. And if the Aran marked the start of a new generation, so most certainly does the Medina. And in the pursuit of excellence, there have been many refinements to the original design. To my mind, the most exciting of them all is the Atlantic 21. With two 60 horsepower outboard engines and a speed of nearly 30 knots, driving this boat is more like riding a racing motorcycle. The coxswain even sits astride the steering console and puts his feet in stirrups to keep him aboard when she gets airborne. And finally, the smaller Y boat, carried by Aaron's and other of the bigger modern boats, to be launched at sea from the bigger boat when particular circumstances arise. But why, you may wonder, are there so many different kinds of lifeboat? The director of the institution is Rear Admiral Wilfred Graham, whose naval career included the command of HMS Ark Royal. Director, your present fleet is almost as complex as that of the Royal Navy. Yes, it is, indeed, and I'm happy to say it's a good deal bigger, too. But why are there so many different kinds of boats, all dedicated to the same purpose? The real reason is, of course, that we try and have horses for courses. There are certain places around the country where you need a big lifeboat and other places where you need a small lifeboat. At the moment, we seem to be running at well over 3,500 lifeboat services every year and they rescue well over a thousand people on average to each year. So that means the lifeboat launches on average ten times a day and on average annually saves the population of an entire village. That's correct. You're very proud of the slogan supported entirely by voluntary contribution. Why? Because I believe this is what the lifeboat men themselves want. Uh, they like to feel that they are supported by voluntary contributions. They themselves are volunteers, and somehow the twinning of, of the voluntary man and the voluntary contribution gives them a, a good feeling. And uh, I believe it's one of the enormous strengths of the institution that, that all the volunteers feel that they're pulling together the same way. That's one of the wonderful things about the RNLI, is it does command enormous respect and popularity and support from the length and breadth of the British Isles, including Ireland, of course. And uh, this is a, a great strength and, and very important that the institution should go on commanding this respect because, of course, that is our, the daily bread. The institution has been going for 160 years. Would you say that it is... Uh modern in its operation now? I sincerely hope so, because it is absolutely critical, I believe, to the success of the institution, that it should be seen to be modern and efficient and effective. I believe that 
saving life at sea now is a very professional business and as you know the Navy and the Air Force get involved as well with their helicopters. Um, there are a lot of people involved in the whole business of search and rescue but one of the the strongest links in the whole chain is the RNLI and if the RNLI was not uh, professional and effective then clearly people would look for an alternative method of doing it. But there is in fact in our country there is no alternative to the RNLI. To anyone with any feeling for ships and the sea, this modern stores and equipment block at pool is like an Aladdin's cave. It even smells right. But more than that, it illustrates the director's comments about the pursuit of excellence. No matter where you find her, you'll never see an RNLI lifeboat looking down at heel. There are two reasons for that. The care and pride lavished upon her by her own people, and also the backup provided by this superb chandlery and workshops which can provide her every need and if necessary in very short order. The RNLI does not build its own lifeboats. That work is entrusted on competitive tender to some of the finest boat building yards in the land. But specialized engineering for maintenance and modification is undertaken here in the well-equipped workshops at Poole. There is also at Poole a modern drawing office for the design, modification and development of current and future lifeboat types, where the experience gained from experimental trials and operational service is, again, dedicated to the continued pursuit of excellence. If I were to say to you, how are you doing, what would you reply? I think the RNLI is doing well. I don't want to be complacent because clearly anyone can always do a bit better. The, but the whole business of maintaining lifeboats, I always think, is, is very complicated and, and important because a lifeboat spends a great deal of its time actually doing nothing. On the other hand, when it is required, everything has got to work first touch of the button. So the maintenance and upkeep is absolutely critical, which is why we spend so much money on it. The fact is that the RNLI doesn't cost the taxpayer a penny piece. That's correct. All dedicated to the lifeboat man, as you said. But what about the lifeboat woman? Well, the lifeboat woman is important. Uh, one of our big lifeboats has a girl in the crew, and quite a large number of the little boats have girls in the crew. So there's absolutely nothing standing in the way of lifeboat women. Do you think it's going to be a coming thing? I'm sure it will be. Actual rescues at sea are seldom seen except by those immediately involved. The job is too important, the response too immediate, and the environment too rugged normally to admit the prying eye of the camera. But very occasionally, and often quite by chance, such pictures have been secured, which show lifeboats and lifeboatmen at their task. Here, Thanks to the people who took those pictures are some such moments. Only those who have experienced it can appreciate the relentless destructive power of a hostile sea. Yet knowing this, and what it can do to vessels far larger than his own, the lifeboatman will face God himself in danger's arm. Rescue by breeches boy is one of the traditional skills of the Coast Guard and with the modern equipment of today as in the past the Coast Guard remains the lifeboatman's ally and partner.
mercifully, some may say miraculously, lifeboat disasters are rare. But this is the Solomon Brown, the Penn Lee lifeboat lost with her crew in an act of selfless heroism that stirred the nation. As you watch these pictures, remember none was staged for the benefit of the camera. Here, for example, imagine the consequences had the lifeboat not arrived in the very last seconds of what was to these fishermen their dangers are. services in saving the crew of the oil rig Orion, driven ashore in appalling weather off the Channel Isles, eight of the institution's coveted awards for gallantry were won by men of the St. Peterport Relief Lifeboat, who returned again and again to the wreck, first in darkness and here later at first light. has a large family of friends in every segment of society, otherwise it couldn't function. I asked Norman Burrow, chairman of James Burrow PLC, whose generous sponsorship made this film possible, why his company, a British family business since 1820, should support the RNLI. Over the generations, all our family have been interested in sailing. And of course, in the last couple of years, we've sponsored uh, two trimorans, beefy to one and two, uh, to try and beat the uh, big flying cloud uh, record from New York round Cape Horn to San Francisco, uh, both of which uh, ended in disaster. Uh, and it was only to the good, good services of the rescue uh, operation uh, that managed to pluck the crew out of the South Atlantic so successfully. And lastly, of course, uh, my cousin, Heather Allen, who donated uh, this super new lifeboat and named after my grandfather, feels that it's right and proper for us to be sponsoring this film and we're delighted to be doing so. And with all that background and experience, what is your personal view of the RNLI? Well, it's quite extraordinary, isn't it? When you think today of all the services around the world which are run by government, and here we have the RNLI being supported entirely by voluntary contributions from a voluntary crew who are dedicated uh, to survival and rescue of people at sea in all weathers and all conditions. It is undoubtedly very efficiently organized, very efficiently run. It's superbly equipped. And you've only got to look around and see the air of uh, authority about the organization. 
Finally, could I ask for a word from our sponsor for all the people who've been watching this film? Well, yes, it must be obviously that the, with all the effort that goes in, and it is vitally important uh, that the contributions continue to flow into the RMLR to see that the service continues. Next time you see a lifeboat, see snug in her boathouse or lying peacefully to her mooring. Remember what you have seen in this film and be proud to be or to become a member of the great family of service, which is the RNLI. Thank you.